This is episode one of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A. J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. That's gorilla with two R's and two L's. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash S-A-J Johnson. And thanks for listening. Tell a friend. This podcast contains fleeting, explicit language. Part 1. Chapter 1. Transcript of Knowledge Monday with Erwin Franco, Summer 2016. Knowledge Monday is a weekly radio show on National Public Radio devoted to discussing current scientific discoveries and controversies. Erwin Franco. Hello and welcome to Knowledge Monday. I am Erwin Franco, and this week we'll be discussing radical environmentalism and whether or not some of the more extreme tactics should be classified as terrorism. We'll be taking your calls later. Our number is 1-800-555-8255. But right now, we have here in studio a representative of a group often referred to as the Eco-Gorillas. That is G-U-E-R-R-I-L-L-A-S, not the primate, although they call themselves the Deep Greens. We won't be using our guest's name at his request, but I can tell you he has a PhD in one of the social sciences and has taught at half a dozen universities in North America. He has traveled widely for his research and is the author of a number of books and articles, some of which focus on the rise and fall of complex social systems in history. So the first question begs to be asked, why don't you like to use your name when speaking for your group? Eco Gorilla. Well, thank you for the opportunity you're giving us, Erwin. It's frustrating for us to see our ideas distorted and maligned in media reports, and we're excited to have a chance to talk to you and your audience because we feel that rational, science-oriented people will react more positively than they expect to our ideas. To your question, I don't use my name for two reasons. First, I'm speaking as a part of a wide-ranging group that's not hierarchical. I'm not a leader. I'm not not the only spokesperson. Every member is free to speak out, but few choose to do so because of the second reason, which is that we fear the retaliation of the U.S. government and industries who see us in conflict with them. Erwin Franco. Let's get right to that topic then. What do you mean in conflict with the government and businesses? Does this include the violent acts that have been attributed to your organization? Eco Gorilla. I want to be very clear here. We're not in conflict with the government or industry. They're in conflict with practically every species on the planet. Our job is to call attention to the wanton destruction wrought on the land, ocean, and air by a small percentage of the human species. From the government and business's point of view, I can understand why they consider themselves to be the established status quo and us to be radical agitators. They see history beginning with the Industrial Revolution. We see history in the long durée. We consider our current form of government and economy as an aberration. For millions of years, humans and their ancestors lived on this planet without massively altering the landscape and the survival prospect for their fellow species. In the last 10,000 years, we have begun to have a greater impact because of the domestication of plants and animals and the adoption of a sedentary lifestyle. And by that I mean an agricultural way of life, not sitting at a desk. Erwin Franco, right. Eco-gorilla. Since the Industrial Revolution, humans' ability to alter the world around us has grown exponentially. Our current way of life has only existed for a generation or two, yet it is presented as the pinnacle of human progress. We want to point out that it is only progress in one sense, and that is how much stuff we can produce. Everybody agrees that we live in the most materially abundant age that has ever existed. But if progress were measured in other ways, such as world happiness, impact on our fellow species and ecological systems, or even health, our current age is middling at best. Thus we see the government and industries as huge social systems that seek to destroy everything except the GDP, which is their only measure of progress. In that sense, they are in conflict with everything and everybody. We, in contrast, are on the side of human survival. Erwin Franco. Okay, that's a lot to unpack, but I see the rhetorical distinction you are making. Do you really think people will give up their current way of life, though? Aren't people happy now? Eco Gorilla. Well, the glib answer is that it doesn't matter if we want to give up our current way of life or not. This way of life will be taken away from us either by our voluntary abdication or by ecological collapse. But in all honesty, I hope that people will start to evaluate critically how they live their lives and through that self reflection realize that this is not the only way to live and that the economy is not the only way to measure national success. It's harder to say whether or not people are happier now. With industrialization and capitalism came advertising, which has probably increased our feelings of inadequacy. In hunter-gatherer societies, possessions were often shared commonly and readily produced from available materials. Status came from age, experience, and personality. Humans are a resilient species, though, and can find happiness in the most adverse circumstances. 
Erwin Franco. I noticed that when you speak, you say humans instead of we. At first, I thought it was a one-off expression, but you keep using it. Are you conscious of this? Eco Gorilla. Yes, of course. It's grown out of our movement's recognition that humans are one species among many on this planet. When most people talk about animals, insects, and plants, they use words that anthropologists would say are othering. That is, they make us feel separate from them. By saying humans, we force ourselves to be cognizant of our space in the world. Erwin Franco. But you can't be suggesting that bedbugs have the same rights and responsibilities as humans. You still swat mosquitoes, don't you? Eco Gorilla. <laughs> yeah, swatting mosquitoes is so ingrained in who I am and where I'm from that I haven't been able to give it up. But to your question, no, we don't think all species have the same rights and responsibilities. Humans have great cognitive abilities, and that's why our rights and responsibilities are much greater than those of bedbugs. We have been abusing our rights, though, by destroying the world around us, and we have shirked our responsibilities. Bedbugs and most other species have a balance between their rights and responsibilities. Take a pack of wolves, for example. It's their right to eat caribou. If they abuse that right by eating too many and depleting the herds, wolf numbers will be reduced through starvation. Because of our hubris, we exploit our resources beyond reasonable limits. It's as if a wolf pack were eating its way across the tundra, growing ever larger. This will only work until they have eaten all of the caribou. Then what? This is the situation humans have gotten themselves into with fossil fuels. There are caribou. Erwin Franco. All right, can we go back to what you said earlier? You said you're not the leader of the eco-gorillas, so who is eco-gorilla? We all are, and none of us. Erwin Franco. I'm sorry, that doesn't make any sense. Eco-gorilla. We're organized in a heterarchy, not a hierarchy. Everybody understands hierarchical organizations because we work at jobs with bosses, learn in school under teachers, competed on teams with coaches and captains, and watched nature shows about wolf packs. Most people have never heard the term heterarchy, but we're all familiar with it. Which cell directs the growth of an oak tree? A tree has many types of cells, each with its own task to carry out. They all function, divide, and help the tree grow. Although no cells are giving commands to the rest, the cells are well organized and work together. We're more like an oak tree than a wolf pack. Erwin Franco. So every person has a say in every decision? Eco Gorilla. Not really. The root cells of an oak tree don't tell the leaves every time they divide, but the leaves will wilt when the roots don't have access to enough water. In the same way, we have committees. Think of them as specialized cells that make decisions and carry out actions that they have developed. We maintain communications among the members through the committees. Some decisions are voted on by all members, and anybody can suggest a vote on a particular topic, but for the most part, each group makes its own decisions on their day-to-day -day activities. It sounds unorganized, but it functions quite well, and like the oak, we're growing. Erwin Franco. How large is your organization? Eco Gorilla. I'd love to stoke the fears of the FBI by saying we are more numerous than those commies they claimed were in every mailbox back during the Red Scare, but I can't give you an honest answer because we don't collect that sort of data, and even if I knew, it's still too early to publicize that information. I will say that we have more than enough people to meet the goals we've set for ourselves. Erwin Franco. Those goals are laid out in your manifesto, which I've read, but I'd prefer it if you could give us a synopsis of what those goals are. Eco Gorilla. Yes, well, we encourage everybody to take an hour and read through the manifesto, or even 10 minutes to read the first section, which gives the most complete summary of our views. We have what we call the three precepts. First, that we, that is humans, must recognize that we are one species among many on this planet. Second, we must live within our available resources, and the best way to do that is to use and mimic natural systems. Finally, we should prefer the simple to the complex and the complex to the complicated. From these three ideas spring the entirety of our goals for the necessary changes in our society and world. Erwin Franco. If those are overarching principles, sure, but... What would that mean for our everyday life? Eco Gorilla. If I describe the systemic changes bluntly, they sound too extreme. I'll give you the big five changes and we can go into more depth if you want. First, we must completely cease using fossil fuels. Second, we must dismantle industrial production. Third, we must convert industrial agriculture to a long lasting system of food production. Fourth, cities must be drastically reduced and modified, and the population must be more evenly distributed over the landscape. And fifth, our economy must be completely reorganized from scratch to reflect real costs instead of arbitrary market prices. Erwin Franco. Um, well, you were right about the changes sounding too blunt because none of those sound like they have a chance of realization. Eco Gorilla. We didn't decide on these changes and then create a rationale to support them. We looked carefully at the undeniable problems in our current system and traced them back to the source. If we can just get off fossil fuels immediately, all the other changes will fall into place more easily. 
Erwin Franco. Even that sounds like a stretch. I think most of us recognize the link between fossil fuels and climate change, but why not use fossil fuels we have to build a non-fossil fuel infrastructure and then change over? Eco-Gorilla. That is a completely reasonable sounding solution, and many of us initially thought of that as a viable option. Let's look at that seriously. We could eliminate fossil fuels and run almost everything using electricity. It doesn't solve the problem of a broken agricultural system, the enormous burden that cities place on their surroundings, poverty in the midst of material abundance, or an economic system that is built on exclusion. The first two are physical problems that must be remedied, and the last two are social ills that should be addressed in any fair and just society. But that presupposes that we could produce enough electricity to replace fossil fuels, which we can't. Fossil fuel is incredibly efficient in the mechanical sense. The huge reservoirs of stored energy have allowed us to artificially increase our bank of resources. But when they're gone, we'll have to go back to more realistic levels of existence. We can either decide to get off these fuel now or be forced to get off them soon. One option is orderly and results in a world that we can pass on to our children. The other will likely end in great violence as those in power fight to stay there. Erwin Franco. But your group advocates using violence to achieve your ends. And this brings us to one of the most pressing topics we want to discuss with you today. The FBI and U.S. Attorney General have described you as terrorists. How does that characterization strike you? Eco-gorilla. The government is using that word to drum up fear because they're afraid of what society will do when they realize who the real terrorists are. Did we dump poisonous chemicals into rivers and drinking water in Charleston, Virginia? Did we spew enough particulate matter in the air to cause asthma among children in St. Louis? Did we continue to knowingly produce and distribute carcinogens in many forms? Did we decide to switch the water source in Flint, Michigan, leading to poisoning children with lead? Did we send young people across the world to die securing cheap oil in Iraq? Did we cause earthquakes in Oklahoma and oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico, Alaska, Michigan, and other vulnerable environments? Did we ignore safety standards and let hundreds of miners die unnecessarily in the Big Branch disaster? No. Unlike the government and businesses, we are unwilling to hurt people physically. We do not see our actions as violent. We see them as a form of self-defense. We only target objects that are directly involved in destroying plants, animals, the land, the water, or the air. People must fear for their physical safety from the government and hazards created by industries, not from us. They are the ecological terrorists. Erwin Franco. Why not work through the existing channels to bring about the change you want? If these ideas are so good, why can't you gain popular support and get elected to offices where you can make these changes? Eco Gorilla. <laughs> I don't even know where to start answering that question, Erwin. First, you know that existing media channels are controlled by the same individuals and groups that are causing the problems. Second, getting public support is hard. We've gotten fat and lazy. It's been generations since the Great Depression and World War II, the last time our community was asked to band together and sacrifice for a common good. People with trust funds only do what they want to do, not necessarily what they should do. Fossil fuels are our trust fund, and when they run out, we're going to be forced to do what we should be doing now. Voluntary austerity is only accepted by a population that fears the consequences of inaction. Climate change does not rate high enough to cause widespread fear, and that's why austerity today is impossible to bring about voluntarily. Yet we must tighten our belts now to survive what's coming. Finally, we have no interest in national office because we advocate for local autonomous governments which operate within an agreed-upon framework with all other governments, again like the cells of a tree. No, the revolution won't work through our existing system because that system has produced the problem. Our entire society and what we value must be completely rebuilt from the ground up. Erwin Franco. Uh, okay then, what sort of values would you advocate? eco gorillas. Our current system teaches us to value waste. When we drive an expensive, gas-guzzling car, we are saying that we have money to burn. Maybe not consciously, but that's the underlying message. Only a complete break with our past will allow us to redefine what value means. It means moving away from the superficial way we fetishize products. Erwin Franco. So are you proposing utilitarianism? Everything must be functional and nothing more? Eco-gorilla. No, absolutely not. Aesthetics and comfort are important to us as a species. We enjoy art that tugs at our heartstrings, clothing that fits and looks the way we like it, and other accoutrements that allow us to express our individuality. 
What we can't stand, though, is that when we satisfy those desires in our current system, we are creating a chain of misery, from the workers in the pesticide-laden cotton fields to the slavery-like conditions of clothing production, For just for one example. Having things you like is wonderful, but they must come without collateral damage. In addition to our three precepts, we've adapted a list written by the renowned ecological philosopher Arne Nass. This list describes practices that we'd like to encourage in our new society. One of them is a lack of what he calls novophilia, which means just not liking the newer novel because it's new. We should celebrate and embrace heirlooms. Kids shouldn't be ostracized for wearing hand-me-downs. This philosophy requires things to be built to last instead of just long enough to outlive their warranty. It would eliminate disposable anything. It means having a few well-made things instead of dozens of cheap ones. Erwin Franco. We have to pause for station identification, but we'll be right back with your calls and questions for the Eco Gorillas. Pause for station identification. Erwin Franco. And we're back. I'm Erwin Franco. This is Knowledge Monday, and we're talking today with a member of the Eco Gorillas. You are very earnest, and I don't mean this question to sound dismissive or disrespectful, but do you really think your group has a chance to foment a revolution that many people think would drag us back into pre industrial peasantry or a second dark age? Eco Gorilla. Leaving aside your use of the terms pre-industrial and peasant for the moment, I would say yes. I think we have a real chance and I'll tell you why. If our system was as stable as everyone thinks it is, a few saboteurs wouldn't be able to destroy it. If it's so stable, what's the government afraid of? Why have the FBI and others tried to infiltrate our organization? Erwin Franco, has that happened? Do you have evidence? Eco Gorillas, I can't go into specific details, but yes, it's happened to us and others. It's standard practice. ELF and other so called terrorist organizations were the targets of massive investigations. Seems overblown for a few misfits with a grudge. No, I think the powers that be are worried for a good reason. But getting back to your pre industrial peasantry comment, we don't have to regress. If we don't make changes now, the system will collapse because of its own weight. If we allow that to happen, we may slip into another dark age. If, however, we dismantle the system and build something better, it can look however we want it to look, within reason, of course. We certainly have some constraints, but they won't be the purview of the landed gentry that serfs had to deal with. We're trying to avert a Mad Max-like scenario where warlords control a few key resources. Erwin Frankel. All right, let's open up the phone lines for questions from our listeners. That number again, 1-800-555-8255. Please be patient. We have a lot of calls today. Let's go first to Renee in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Hello, Renee, and welcome to Knowledge Monday. What's your question, Renee? Hello, Erwin, and thanks for taking my call, Erwin Frankel. Surely, go ahead, Renee. I've secretly been thinking the things your guest has been saying. I thought I was the only one. How do I get in touch with the Eco Gorillas? Do they have local chapters? Erwin Franco. Okay, thanks, Renee. How about it? Where do people find you, Eco Gorilla? Unfortunately, we are not able to advertise our whereabouts or meetings. We're excited when others have reached the same conclusions as us, but we cannot take volunteers for security reasons. The FBI has a long history of infiltrating groups it wants to keep an eye on, from the Black Panthers and MLK's organization to other ecological groups. The most common method is to have undercover agents show up at an open meeting and strike up a friendship with its members. Erwin Franco. But you claim to have a growing organization. How does that work without recruitment? Eco Gorilla. Oh, we're recruiting, but to use that worn-out expression, don't call us, we'll call you, current members approach potential recruits on a one-on-one basis. I'm not going to outline our screening process on air, but we have one, and it's rigorous enough to expose potential moles. In short, though, the easiest way to get noticed by us is to talk about us. Bring us up when chatting with your friends. You're most likely to be recruited by somebody who's known you for at least a few years. Don't look for us on social media, but make it clear on which side of history you stand. Erwin Franco, why aren't you on social media? Modern organizations try to uh, cultivate an online presence. Eco Gorillas, for many reasons we try and have face-to-face interactions. Part of it is for security, but philosophically we prefer human interactions to virtual ones. Erwin Franco, our next caller is Ted from Wyoming. Go right ahead, Ted. Hello, Erwin and guests. I worked in the coal industry my whole life. Most of my family still works in coal. We are obviously worried about new regulations that cut down on coal use because that means real people lose their jobs. It sounds like everybody's going to be out of work if your guest has his way. Rowan Franco. How about it? If I understand your position on the coal, oil, and auto industries, as well as industrial production and agriculture, would all be shut down. That's a lot of jobs and sounds like sliding into an economic downturn worse than the Great Depression. Eco Gorilla. It's a good question, but the premise is flawed. Most people today assume that our current way of life can and should be sustained into the future. It can't. 
It isn't us shutting down the industries. They are unsustainable, and we're just trying to wean society off them before ecological collapse forces them under. We need people whose jobs contribute directly to their own subsistence and to the benefit of those living around them, their family, friends, and community. You mentioned the Depression, Irwin. That's something we're not worried about. We see money for what it is, a made-up yardstick for measuring social capital. It has no inherent value. If one's food, shelter, safety, and health are assured, money is superfluous. We'd like to see a new economy built on real things, not a made-up measurement like the GDP. Is my life demonstrably better or worse because the Dow Jones goes up or down? No. We are not just advocating for a change in social relations. We are pushing for a completely different way of supporting ourselves. We want a new economic system. Erwin Franco. But what about these jobs? Eco-gorillas. Coal specifically has been undergoing a reduction because of mechanization. It isn't a dozen miners grubbing out ore with picks anymore. It's large, house-side excavators driven by a single person. That's where the coal jobs went. With the collapse of the fossil fuel and industrial infrastructure, though, we'll have new jobs. Many of the people working in these industries like the idea of self-sufficiency. Well, in the future we're working to bring about, every person will have plenty to do and still have time for relaxation with friends and family. Erwin Franco. Are you getting rid of money and bringing back barter? Eco Gorilla. That is something for each community to decide for itself. I feel that money is an abstraction and people get so wrapped up in its pursuit that getting rid of it would be for the best. Others in our organization disagree. They feel that people growing up in this new way of life will not place such importance on made up value. Erwin Franco. Well, unfortunately, we are running over on this segment already, and I feel like we have only scratched the surface of this topic. Maybe we can have you back for another interview later to see how your organization is progressing. Thank you for coming in and talking with us today, Eco Gorilla. Thank you for having me, Erwin, and giving us a chance to express ourselves to your audience. Can I plug our manifesto? We don't have a website or official Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook accounts. Those websites that you can find online are made up by well-wishers and opponents trying to discredit us. But if you Google for Eco Gorilla, that's one word, manifesto, you You'll find many online versions that were printed in newspapers around the country. I think uh, Earth First has a copy on their website as well. Thanks again for having me. Erwin Franco. My pleasure. And well, uh, I don't know if I should wish you luck or not. <laughs> Eco Gorilla. That, that's okay. Thanks, Erwin. Chapter 2. Deeper Ecology. The Green Manifesto. The following excerpts describe the theoretical underpinnings of the group known colloquially as the eco-gorillas. We refer to ourselves as deeper ecologists or deep greens and pine for the day when we can leave the shadows and thrive in a society that values and respects its position on this planet. As our opponents seek to characterize us as quote-unquote radicals, terrorists, and in one case, quote, fringe nut jobs, end quote, we thought it would be appropriate for us to speak for ourselves instead of letting the enemies of human survival continue to misrepresent our message. Section 1. Ideas. Deeper Ecology. The environment has played a prominent role in the rise and fall of civilizations throughout history and will have an outsized effect on industrialized society. But people's raising awareness of problems with greenhouse emissions, fossil fuels, the Arctic, dams, rainforests, and endangered species are dismissed as alarmists. We, the Deep Greens, have a firm grounding in earth sciences and understand the factual dangers facing our world. Unfortunately, most scientists speak in measured tones about climate change. Climate change deniers and other groups with vested interests in maintaining the status quo are willing to use hyperbolic language, air tactics, and outright lies to discredit the careful words of climate scientists. We choose to set aside the measured language of science and speak from the heart. Climate change is real. We are the cause. Its effects are terrifying. And we have passed the point of no return on global warming. And we must stop emitting greenhouse gases immediately in order to protect the survival of most species adapted for life on this planet, including humans. Section 1.0.1, Deep Ecology. Environmentalists are painted with a broad brush. To many, these tree huggers can seem more concerned with the lives of salamanders and polar bears than people. But the situation is more nuanced. We would like to call attention to a cleft in the environmental monolith. In 1973, a Norwegian ecologist and philosopher, Arne Nass, divided the environmental movement into two halves— the shallow, and the deep. Note, see Arnie Nass, The Shallow and the Deep, Long Range Ecological Movement, A Summary, 1973. 
The Essays in George Sesson's Deep Ecology for the 21st Century, 1995, and NASA's 1989 Ecology, a Community and Lifestyle Outline of an Ecosophie, 1989. Ecosophie is the term he uses to describe his ecological philosophy. End of note. Shallow environmentalists are those interested in preserving the Earth and its creatures to create a more comfortable habitat for human beings. They would say, don't pollute that water, I drink it. And in contrast, a deep environmentalist would decry the pollution because of the thousands of species that depend on each body of water. Deep ecologists, as they are called, recognize the interconnectedness of all life on Earth and that all organisms have an intrinsic right to exist. They champion ecological diversity and symbiosis, as well as classless, democratic, self-sufficient, small-scale, and autonomous communities. Note, NAS, 1973, end of note. Their critique of mainstream environmentalism and conservation for the benefit of humans is central to our future as inhabitants of this planet. As we are willing to take a catastrophic role in dismantling the forces that are destroying our planet, we refer to ourselves as deeper ecologists or deep greens. Section 1.0.2 Anthropocentrism. Anthropocentrism, or the belief that we as humans, or worse, as a specific group of humans, are special, is our biggest problem. Buddhists and deep ecologists got it right. We are just bits of carbon on a little speck of real estate on the outskirts of a massive universe. Furthermore, our time here lasts but the blink of an eye compared to the four billion years that life has existed on this planet. We do not say this to make you feel inconsequential, but to remind you to think beyond yourself, your family, your friends and acquaintances, and even beyond everybody alive today. Although we as individuals are rather inconsequential, we must recognize that together our actions affect other humans, animals, plants, and ecosystems. Humans' ability to think and understand the world is profound, but with greater knowledge comes the responsibility to live within our resources. End of episode one of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com. <laughs>